Hi, good evening, everybody. I hope you're okay. So I hope you can all hear me. We're just going to do a quick test just to make sure that you're all there. Would you mind um, putting in the chat box a quick hello, just so that I know that um, all the sounds working okay and that you can see us? Ah, brilliant, lovely. Okay, fantastic. So nice to see you all this evening. So we've got about 400 um, registered, which is amazing. Um, so great to see you all. And this evening, we're going to be talking to Ronnie Staten um, about ultra running. And you might know Ronnie, um, he's an ultra runner coach and also a race director. So Ronnie directs the Hobo Pace um, races in the Midlands, which you might know him from. And he's also a motivational speaker. So should be a really good session this evening. Um, it's going to be recorded. We're going to have it on YouTube afterwards uh, if you want to look back. And format for tonight is Ronnie's going to do a bit of a chat. It's going to be quite casual, going to go through a few key topics around ultra running. And then after about 30, 40 minutes, we're going to have time for Q&A. Now, I've got a feeling there's going to be quite a lot of questions this evening um, for Ronnie about ultra running. So what I've tried to do, which I hope has worked, on your banner at the bottom of the screen, there's a box for Q&A. Um, so if you put your questions in there as opposed to the chat box, but you should be able to see the questions that other people have asked. So if that's similar to what you're going to be asking, you can actually upvote that question. So, you know, if somebody's asked about fueling or training a particular aspect that you're interested in, to help us cut down and be a bit more efficient with the questions, give them an upvote, um, have a look, see if your question's there, but feel free to put anything in there and we'll work through them as soon as we've done the main presentation and the chat, okay? So, um, just to let you know, if there's any sort of kit or any help that you need with kit, um, uh, at Harrier, we've got loads of things. We've got race vests, we've got hydration options, um, safety for minimum kit. So feel free to have a look what we've got available. And if you need any help, you can always chat to myself. Um, Kate's always available if you need any help with choices after this webinar. So um, without further ado, we'll say hello to Ronnie and uh, we'll get a bit of an introduction from you, Ronnie, if that's okay. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, thank you everyone for coming in. I just think it's great to have such high numbers and it, it really represents the growth of ultra running. So, you know, thank you to Kate for having me on here tonight because, uh, yeah, what an honour to speak about one of my true passions with so many people. Uh, are we going to do the poll, Kate, of, of how many people have, have run the uh, an ultra? Yeah, we'll do that now. So let's go on to the poll questions. So we thought that we'd do a couple of quick questions uh, just to get a bit of a feel for, um, for the audience and what you guys are interested in for this evening. So you can vote for your answers on the screen. So first of all, we'll do our first question. We've got two. So first question, have you completed an ultra distance before? And I say distance rather than race, because it doesn't have to be a race. You know, you may, may have just had like a really nice long run one day, sort of 50k mark. OK, so results are coming in now. Just give it another 30 seconds and then I'll close it and share the results. So ah, it's about half and half, actually. So I shared those results. 52 percent for yes and 48 percent for no. OK, great. Now, the second one. Um, we thought this one would be interesting just to get into a bit more of the psyche um, behind what you're wanting to learn about this evening. So could you tell us what are your biggest barriers in relation to your ultra running or what you're hoping to do? And you can also select multiple here. So if there's a couple of things, put as many answers in as you like, and then we can see. So some of the things that we've put are time, money, um, if you're worried about navigation, if you've not got mates to run with, uh, fitness, injury. Let me just scroll down to some of the others. Okay, just give it a couple more seconds and then we'll share the results. Okay, we'll stop it there. Right, so I'm just going to share the results now. Um, Oh, that's annoying. Oh, I can scroll down. So it seems like time is a massive one, 46%. Can you see the results there, Ronnie? I can see them, yes. Yeah. So time is a big one. Fitness, injury, confidence, 
eating habits is a biggie and um, injuries a bit less running buddies a bit less and money's a bit less so it seems like yeah time fitness confidence eating habits are some of the key ones so stop those for now okay that's great that's me done thanks okay no brilliant yeah it's, it's interesting it's time we'd perhaps uh, know or think it might be time but the great thing is we've all got 24 hours a day and there might be things that we can do to leverage some time for our running so I'm, I'm quite pleased you know if it's money I can't give you any money but if it's time it maybe maybe I can encourage you a little bit this evening with the fact that maybe you haven't got to train as much as you, as you might thought you, you might have to when thinking about uh, an ultra my talk's going to be roughly 45 minutes I know uh, Dave and Kerry they, they use slides they use a, a presentation format my mind's a little bit too random uh, to stick to slides, so I thought I'll actually be better. Um, I've got some notes, which I hope to keep to roughly, but I'm going to allow myself just to flow and meander where I need to go, and, and hopefully that'll be insightful to you. It's great to see that about half of you haven't run an ultra yet, so obviously you're aspirational ultra runners, and also half have, so I'd like to think um, I can offer some... Uh, helpful tips for you guys as well. So I'm going to start right at the beginning, There's no better place to start, but what is ultra running? Well, in essence, ultra running is any distance above 26.2 miles. Now, ultra running could be in all kinds of different places, terrains, it normally includes some inclement weather or arduous terrain. Kerry was talking last week about sky running. Uh, and how sky running is, is predominantly ultra distance as well. So ultra running is this umbrella generic term really for any distance above that 26.2. Now, some people say anchors more around 100 mile and that might be so, that might be their opinion, but in reality, the definition of it is anything um, above that marathon distance. Some ultras are defined by time so for instance a 24-hour event uh, where you're trying to run as far as you can and obviously the winner is the person who runs the furthest in that time bracket but more commonly ultras are from a to b a set distance and you have a, an allocated time to get there now You'll also often have a cutoff that holds the event together. And the cutoffs are not to make the sport elitist. Um, as a right race director myself, you need cutoffs to hold the volunteers and hold the race together. Ultra running is a very inclusive sport or hobby or pastime, whatever you want to frame it as. Um, and the cutoffs are there just to keep things safe. But some people will find themselves uh, fighting those cutoffs. Um, there's also multi-day events as well, which can cover vast distances day after day where the clock stops. And then there's also very long ultras where the clock doesn't stop and you've just got to get there as, as quickly as possible. It's worth mentioning and the history of ultra running is incredibly colourful. And, and if anybody's interested in it, I think you'd uncover a, a lot of great facts as you, as you went through the history books and ultra running. But the, 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 the great thing about it is human beings, really, since they went bipedal, since they stood up, have been designed to cover vast distances. Now, uh, every man and his dog, it seems, has read Born to Run by Christopher McDougall. Um, if you haven't read it, that does give some insights how we've evolved as people to, to stand up and cover distance as hunter-gatherers. We've also got... Uh, our nomadic ancestors as well that traveled the land to hunt and to farm and even when thousands of years ago there was um, a land bridge between Asia and North America it's been found people traversed through the Great Plains mountainous areas and deserts human beings are designed to ultra run there's no doubt about it or in more more factual to, to cover long distances. Locomotion, I often just refer to it as because whether you run, walk or crawl, you're just trying to get to the end and ultra running is not always a pure running. It can be for the, the elites, it can be for the, the top guys, but um, everyone else is tend to go into walk on an ultra. There's, a, there's a, an amazing book 
that for me bridges the gap between our, our old ancestors and modern day running written by Jeff Williams, which is talking about the 1928 coast to coast race, Trans America race um, in America. And it, it's written about a guy called CC Pyle with the nickname Cash and Carry, who was a bit of a sport agent, a bit of a character. And he offered a purse to, to anyone that could run across America. Uh, and it was just shy of three and a half thousand miles. But I think it's probably one of the best running books I've ever read in my life. Um, the hardship these guys go through. You know, there were 300 that started, not many finished. Um, but some of them weren't even runners. It was in the Great Depression in, in, the, in the 1920s, 1930s in America. And these guys were desperate to win money for a better life. A very poignant story. And C.C. Pyle was a bit of a con man and he didn't even really deliver on his word of the aid stations and the food and the clothing. And I'm not even so sure he paid everyone who did finish as well. But a great book. I just really had to mention that because there's a lot of us perhaps that feel ultra running is pretty new um, and it is so not new. The exponential growth is new and it seems to be going in a, a, in a linear fashion. And that's that's great. And that's showing and it's interesting. So many have logged in tonight. That's great for the future of our support. But it is not new. And, and many people have been doing this uh, for a long time. Yes, Kate. What's the name of the book, please? The name of the book is uh, The Amazing uh, Foot Race. Um, I think, uh, yeah, C.C. Pyle's Amazing Foot Race. And right. it's 1928, written by Jeff Williams. So maybe we can tag that in because every runner needs to uh, read that book. And if you ever felt like complaining on a race, you perhaps <laughs> just refer your mind back to, the, to what these guys went through running uh, across America and uh, you, you just don't complain about there not being enough jelly babies and stuff. The, these guys went through hell uh, and they did it in plimsolls, of course, um, sometimes not getting fed and sometimes not even being provided a bed. But it, it's just, again, a testament to the resilience and the perseverance of people. Uh, you know, they that was poignant. That was sad because they was forced into that position. But um, great book great story and i really recommend it and it shows 1928 people was doing multi-day ultras like that um the other thing i really wanted to mention at this point is the long distance walking association because in the uk that has really in my opinion driven ultra running within the uk because a lot of runners now coming to it perhaps have missed that 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 bridging gap that that the ldwa did but it was more so their flagship 100 mile event, which was in the bank holiday in, in the May. You know, over the last decade or so, them hosting that 100 mile event put a 100 mile event on in the UK. Now, it makes sense if someone's going to challenge themselves to walk 100 miles, then somebody's going to think, you know what, I fancy running 100 miles. And then that coincided somewhat with the great work that James Elson's done with Centurion Running because he was really innovative going to America. America was at this before us again. Uh, unfortunately, it seems to be the way and then we follow suit from America. But James went over there, ran a lot of uh, American races and decided to set up within the UK American styled races really and he achieved it um, in a phenomenal way. And I'm proud to say I ran his first Centurion running event in 2011 on the North Downs Way. Um, and and he, ha he has been an incredible force for ultra running, which I think every, every runner who knows Centurion running appreciates. But uh, back 10 years ago, and that, that first race, there were 60 people on it, I think. Um, and there was, there was very few 100-mile races. There was very few ultras. 10 years ago so that's when I really started and um, to see the growth um, within this decade it's just been exceptional and it, it is a linear growth it does continue to go but for any runner because I think the, the LDWA was founded in 1972 and it's built its way up and it's got about 10,000 members now it's only about 18 pound per year 
But the thing is, 10,000 members feels to me as though there must be a hell of a lot of runners and ultra runners that are not members of the LDWA. And I, I feel we're missing a trick there because not only do I feel we owe some of our ultra running routes to them, but also you get access online to up to 1600 long distance paths. If you like planning, if you like roaming around, if you like running long distances, I cannot understand why you would not join the LDWA, even if it was just for the online access. You get the GPX files, the whole lot. Um, I've used it no end and, and just for when you're just dreaming and building up visions of, of where you might want to go and what you want to do. So, yeah, Long Distance Walking Association, I, I, I personally feel all ultra runners should be members of them as well. Um, who does it? Like, who does ultra running? Well, the fact of the matter is everybody, everybody and anybody is, is ultra running who can all different types of backgrounds, personalities, age ranges. Legally, you've got to be over 21 to run a 100 miler, um, but there's no age limit on the upper bracket, you know, it, it, and it does tend to be a more senior sport. People are more mature. I'd say the average age roughly around 40. We're getting younger people now because the sport's getting recognised more, but um, and that'll be interesting for records, um, and course records and fastest known times because as, as people in their mid-20s come to the sport, if they're really talented, then it goes to reason they should be in their peak also. Whereas, unfortunately, a lot of talented ultra runners maybe didn't find uh, ultra running until later in life, in their 30s and maybe 40s. So, you know, time should get faster as younger people are, are running that as well. You know, as a coach, I have a, a whole range of different people. I predominantly coach ultra runners and 99% ultra runners. You can't really tar ultra runners with the same brush. They tend to be a little bit extreme. I, I, I'll, I'll go with that. Driven people, motivated people, but um, all different types of, of, of personality. And the, the, the great thing is as well, there's a, there's, there is an increase in the female participation on the 10 mile that I organize, I actually get more females than males on the 10 miler. Of course, that's not ultra running. On the, on the Robin Hood 100, it's starting to it's slightly less than a third of women, but it's increasing each and every year. Now, if you think back, in 1967, Catherine Switzer ran the Boston Marathon illegally. And, she, and officials were trying to pull her off the Boston Marathon. Women was not allowed to take part. And I don't know why, but it took five years till 1972 for it to be legal for females to run the Boston Marathon. So that's not that far long ago, you know, like 50 odd years ago, females weren't even allowed to participate in the major marathons. So... It's great to see uh, an uprising, if you will, of more females running ultras. And I think they do have more challenges than perhaps most men. For the reason being, ultras can go a long way. They can go through the night. And especially like the London ultras and stuff, they can go through the city. They can go through some you know, not so good areas, let's say. Now, race officials and race directors do their utmost to try and make it safe. But... There's places I run through the night, you know, I'm old and ugly and I don't really care. I, I'm going to go and run through the night. But, you know, my wife, for instance, when I tell her where I've been running, she's like, there's no way I'd run down that street or on that trail in the, in the thick of, of darkness. So I do see this disparity or the heightened challenges that females may have um, from, from the nature of ultra running uh, being a long way. But, I think in 2017, uh, over 130,000 people finished ultras. And apparently there's over 2,000 global ultra events now. So ultra running, isn't, you're not special for being an ultra runner anymore, basically. There's a lot of people doing it. And I think when, when it was first kicking off a decade ago, I think there were one or two ultra runners that felt a little bit put out of place, like as though people were standing on their toes. Um, and that they perhaps are the same people. I, I think they've adapted now mostly, but some of those were the people saying, 
you know, 30 miles, not an ultra. It has to be at least 100 mile. And, it, you know, uh, with that prestige and quite pretentious. But, you know, most of them guys, I think, have now adapted. But, you know, so why, why would you want to run an ultra? You know, it's a very good question. And like I said, I work with a lot of people who all have varying and, and differing motives, different characters, different personalities, different reasons for doing what they're doing. But I'm hoping with uh, with the rest of this seminar, really, I touch upon like why really you, you would want to run an ultra. Um, I often get asked, how do you know when you're ready to run an ultra? You know, just how do you know? if you, So half you guys on here tonight, or aspirational ultra runners, you haven't done it yet. So how do you know when you are ready to make that leap? Now, I'm gonna class ultra as the 50K mark to 50 miles. So about 31 miles to 50 miles, otherwise we're gonna get lost with this tonight. So ultra, I'm talking 30 to 50 mile. Well, I think the, there's a couple of benchmarks that are really important to hit. I think the first benchmark you've got to be looking to hit is running consistency. It might sound obvious, but if you're not consistent in your running week to week, and I'm looking at about four times per week, three, you might get away with, but you know, if you're looking to do an ultra, really, you want your consistency a little higher than that. You want to be looking more towards four times per week. I'll get onto distance and things in a second, but just consistency, because consistency is key that is the biggest thing that is going to get you the progress not having a good few weeks or a big weekend consistency is key so you need that that regular running is a benchmark the second thing i'd be asking myself if i was going to step into an ultra would be am i injury prone what is the current state of my body am i am i uh, riddled with niggles have i got niggles in my achilles my knee my hip my neck whatever Am I injured a lot? And, that, and is that making me uh, unable to keep my running consistency? It doesn't seem a good idea to me to book on and put yourself through an ultra if you're currently injured and not hitting your four times per week running, whether that was three miles each session or 10, it doesn't matter. But if you can't consistently run because you're injured, I, th I think we've got a problem there. So two benchmarks, be consistent, and, and, be, and don't be injured. Um, necessary skill sets. Uh, what skill sets might you need before you ultra run? And hopefully we can get over some barriers tonight as well. So they're not barriers, they're just things you're aware of and you can work on and you can all become ultra runners when COVID allows uh, late, later in this year, hopefully. The first thing is you need to be able to tackle the terrain. Again, it's a little obvious, but people do get this wrong. If you're going to book on something like the Lakeland 100 or whatever, yeah, which a lot of people do from nowhere near the lakes, that's mountainous terrain. And people might struggle to get to mountains to train on. If you can't tackle the terrain and you book an ultra in such an environment, you're going to really struggle uh, when you get there. So skill set is be able to move on the terrain. The other one is basic navigation. And I'm saying basic, as basic as learning to pay attention to at least the direction you're going in and to what you're passing. And now, listen, I get lost. Like I'm not going to get on my high horse here. I, I get lost a lot, but it's normally when I've lost my mind after 150 miles or so, but I do get lost. But the point is runners will sometimes ring me as a race director and say, I'm in a field and I can see some trees and I'm lost. And, I, and it, it could not be more ambiguous than that. And I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. They'd say that, they say, I'm in a field and I can see some trees. My first question is, what was the last aid station you went through or where are you heading to? Quite often the reply is, I don't know. Now, if I don't know what aid stations have gone through and I can't see them on the tracker, I've absolutely no idea where they are. And I get into them to describe the route. Normally I know it that well. I know roughly where they've come off. 
But basic navigation can be as simple as that. It can be just what a station have I just gone through? How long ago did I leave it? And at least get these things in your head before you call me or you call a, a, a race director. The Mountain Run are delivering uh, great basic navigation courses online. Uh, I did it myself just to refresh the basics because I am prone to get lost or navigationally challenged as we like to call it. Um, and so that's a great course while we're in lockdown to do that. And it does work on Zoom. You perhaps think it doesn't, but it, but it does. Uh, use of your kit. You need that skill set. Running ultra running kits easy, you know, it's not like skiing and things like this. Like ultra running, you, you've got you've got a bag, you've got your Harrier bag, you, you've got your fell shoes or your or your trainers uh, or whatever else. But the amount of people that run their first ultra and they get chafing or they don't know where stuff is kept in their bag and they get problems, it's because they've not done it in training. And I'm always scratching my head with that one a little bit. So Learn to use your kit. If you've got a handheld GPS, know how to use it. If you know how to use your watch, you know, know, know how to use and charge your head torch. Simple little things, know how to use your kit. The other thing is wearing clothes. Uh, you, can, you can research this very easily on, on Google. It's not rocket science, but you need to know it. Even in summer, through the night, you get a torrential downpour. A lot of people after DNF did not finish because of they're so cold. If you know how to layer your clothes and your kit, you give yourself a, a much more chance of, of finishing uh, that race. So learn your base layers, learn your mid layers, and learn what waterproofs. Now, the great thing is kit is so good nowadays that you're unlikely to have bad kit. You just know you need to know how to dress. And the last thing is you need to learn and understand how your body responds. And you'll learn this through training. How do you feel when you're low on sugar? How do you feel when your electrolytes low? How do you feel when you're thirsty, when you're hungry? And read up on what happens to your body if you are going into hypothermia. Because although I'm not suggesting you put yourself in hypothermia to understand it, I am saying read about it know the symptoms um, because that can catch you out especially in mountainous uh, areas um, so they're the kind of skill sets you need but how do you prepare how do you actually prepare for a 30 to 50 mile when, when you've not run an ultra before um, what should be the longest distance of the long run get asked that all the time so what how far should the long run be if i'm running a 30 to 50 miler well, I would say, and most coaches I know would agree with me, those I've spoke to at least, we're looking at about 25 miles, even for the 50 miler. You're not really going to go above the 25 mile point um, or six hours. It depends on the terrain and it depends on the type of session that you're doing. If you're in the mountains or really undulating hilly areas, then we might use time and limit it and cap it to six hours. Um, or if you're in flatter areas like me in Lincolnshire, we might say 25 miles. Now, the interesting thing is, and people said time at the start has been a, a bit of a barrier or perceived barrier to becoming an ultra runner. But you, even if you're training for a hundred miler, you tend not to run further than 25 miles day to day um, on the weekend. The reason being is you enter too much of a cost relationship for the value you get over that distance. So we want the value, we want to limit the cost. And going over six hours, going over 25 miles, it can be cost heavy for the amount of value that you will get. Um, but what you will do um, when you are training for 100 as opposed to a 30 or 50 miler, is you might have a breakthrough event to use an event as a stepping stone. So you might run a 50 mile event or while COVID's off, if you could do it safely with loops near your home, for instance, um, a 50 mile solo or self-supported run um, as a breakthrough session. But they're going to be really rare. Um, I'm talking week to week. You're not really going to go over 25. I'm not asking people to do that. Um, but the breakthrough workout is important. But what you got to know is there's no magic golden bullet uh, formula that you can come up with to give you a percentage that will tell you 
how long your long run should be. Um, if you're going to run 200 miles, for instance, if you get a real desire for the bigger game uh, and the real long distance stuff, you're not going to run 150 miles or 170 miles to, to train yourself to run 200. You're probably going to cap it at 100 still, and then you're going to have to just suck it and see on the day and go for it. And that's the big challenge of the bigger distances, even on a hundred mile. Yes, Kate. Oh, sorry. I was just going to say, right. So would you say, is it better for people to um, go by time on feet rather than distance? Depends on terrain. Uh, I do like time a lot when I, when I'm giving uh, sessions to my runners more in the hills or if there's any hiking uh, interlace with the running, we'll work from time and record the mileage, but not so bothered about it. If you're working on flatter areas and it's more of an easy endurance run, we'll tend to use mileage because you've not got any arduous terrain really uh, to stop you. So time on feet is good, but you can't kid yourself with it. You can't go too easy on yourself, wander around, have a picnic and this and that and go, wow, oh, I clocked up four hours. That can be dangerous with time on feet. So you've got to get the balance. We live in a bit of a binary society, you know, black and white, this or that, time on feet or mileage. We need both. We need to be in the middle. And that's my approach all the time is we, we, need, to, we need to have a confluence of ideas and bring them together rather than this binary thinking, this dualistic thinking that this is right, this is wrong, or this is better, and that's not so good. It's often in the middle, I found. So, yeah, great question. Um, do, just uh, use both, and I use both uh, all the time. But So that, that's, that gives you an idea of that longest run. And I think most, it's obviously hugely relevant to where you're at now and what you can do. I'm not suggesting for a second, if you've gone nowhere near 25 miles, just because you booked on a 50 mile, you go out and run 25 miles. It's going to have to be progressive and build you up. I'm just giving you the best I can, a cap of what I would have somebody run. Uh, how many miles per week? Again, this is, this is a, a beauty and this is one that I'll get all the time. How many miles a week should I be running realistically if I'm on a 30 to 50 miler? Now, I think as an ultra runner, especially looking to dip the toe in it and have a go at it, um, 30 to 50 miles accumulative per week is a, is a great number. You know, 30 to 50 miles is going to keep you consistent, and that's the key. Um, it's going to keep you getting out there. It's going to give you the variety of runs. It shouldn't be too much of a stretch to you for your resources, for your time, for your energy. Um, and so around that kind of figure, 30 to 50 miles per week is what I see people do really well. Of. But the interesting thing is, I see people do humongous, monstrous things of doing 50 to 60 miles per week. And that is it. And everyone thinks these guys must and girls must go out and run 100 mile weeks all the time. And they really don't. I've, I've been in a very fortunate position to see how well people can do on events and what they've done to get there. You know, hundreds of people over the years that I've worked with, I can see how they prepare and how they fare. Um, and I can see what they've done. Now it's unequivocal that the more you run, the better your running efficient gets. The higher your running volume, in theory, the better runner you will be. That research is done, it, it is unequivocal. Um, it, it, the proofs in the pudding from the runners that have done it but the big caveat with it is if you can't handle the mileage if you get injured if you can't recover if you've got young kids like i have if you're stressed in your job things like this you can't do most people in today's busy society do not suit high volume running and so i think it should be hugely incentivizing and encouraging to people listening that if they've got 100 mile ambitions or beyond uh, and and difficult events like UTMB some might want to do Marathon de Sables just to pick some of the more popular common ones people know of um, you can do that of 50 to 60 miles per week and I'm not going to talk about myself too much but in the, in 2013 when I ran the, the Sir Alfred Wainwright's coast to coast in 55 hours I was doing 55 miles per week um, and I was actually coaching under James Elson at the time. And we went, I felt best of 55 miles per week. Now I've got to add, I did a fair bit of swimming 
and I was stronger back then in the gym. I did a lot of strength and conditioning. That's eased off as I've got older in many respects and just how my life's gone. Uh, so I do run more now. But, you know, that's nearly 200 miles and I was only running 55 miles per week. I don't say it to boast. I say it to encourage people that I don't think you have to run massive, massive uh, weekly accumulative miles to do really well. If you can and you can recover, then you will be a better runner. But if you can't, you can you can do it off off less. And if you're not doing much cross training, you may want to, to run more. That's just a given. You'll have more time uh, since my stroke, for instance. I don't want to forget how to run. I, I run a lot more now because I've got the brain damage. My left side was paralyzed. So I want to spend as much time as I can running and working on my running economy and efficiency. So I will run around 100 mile weeks now because that's where I feel I need to be before I felt like I could feel good off less miles. Um, the back to backs work, back to back training where you have one big run and then another big run the day after. It's a hot to topic in ultra running, always has been. Now, yes, in one word, ultra uh, back to backs do work, they do improve you, but we have to look a little bit at the science as to why they work and the and the big problems of them let's take if let's take the weekend if you was going to do 20 miles saturday and 20 miles sunday which might be a common back to back for someone um you're running the sunday without being recovered that's that, that's a given that's why you're running the back to back and, and it's supposed to train your body give it more stress and therefore you'll get more adaptation and you will improve as a runner but of course sunday you're running with the fatigue of Saturday and that's seen as the positive thing to train your body but the point is if you get to 10 miles on the Sunday and you're kind of crawling and you're getting pain in your Achilles or wherever it might be and you slog out then less 10 than last 10 miles they're really poor quality and you're getting a lot more cost than the value for them and that's becoming a bad idea for you you could argue you're getting some mental training from it but again if it's at the cost of your body and you lose your consistency again that that's bad planning that's a, that's a bad idea now i'm not going to get too bogged down in the science but there is something called a, a cytokine which is protein based and, and, and information to the cells um, and something called interleukin-6, which is the cytokine. Now, IL-6 gets produced when you are fatigued and that's why you feel fatigued from this chemical. Now, when you recovery run or do a back to back, you start with a high level of this IL-6 in your body. And this, this chemical is not only responsible for the fatigue, but it's responsible for making our bodies more robust and um, giving the muscles that depth and, and that strength that they need. So great for ultra runners. But here's, here's the thing. When you just start on the Sunday, even if you just went for a little walk, you have a higher level of the IL-6. And so it, the body creates more of it straight away because the, the damage is already in the muscles. So my point is you don't have to do much to get the second wave of that chemical that then when it's laid down in recovery, you become stronger and more robust. So what I often do, therefore, is have the second run easier in effort or smaller. So it might be 20 miles Saturday and more like 10 to 15 miles Sunday, or it might be the same distance, but more what Kate said, like time on feet, where you're going to hike a lot and you're going to keep the effort, perceived effort, really easy because you're already winning. You've already got the chemical in your body. You don't have to work too hard to stimulate more growth. And if you do work too hard, what you do is you break yourself down even more. What this leads to is, again, we're coming back to consistency. You put a big weekend in and put too much emphasis on a back to back, you will find that you can't get going till Wednesday. Like you, you, you're not really running through the week because you're so shattered from the weekend and you're doing big weekends. You put a lot of trauma in your body at the weekend and you lose consistency and the body does not like that. You'd be better with the consistency of running um, all the time. 
think about it. You know, if you're going to do anything good for your body, whether it be eat healthily on the weekend, uh, it wouldn't be any good if you just did it on the weekend. If you was going to meditate, it wouldn't just be any good on the weekend. It would be the consistency again. So back to backs, yes, but take them with a pinch of salt. They are not the be all and end all. You need to be sensible with them. Yes, Kate. So you might come on to this, but just in case you're not, I was going to ask about long runs, just a bit more detail. Like how would you kind of gauge your long runs compared to your overall weekly volume or what you're working on? Because I don't know about other people, but I do tend to sabotage my midweek stuff a lot by getting a bit over uh, zealous on my long runs. And then, like you say, you can't be consistent the next week. Yeah, no, no, it's a great question. Again, you, if you want to, if you want to be a geek with it, you might want to put percentages on it. It's not the way I work as a coach. If someone's able to run easy endurance miles of, say, 10 miles on a Tuesday, then straight away it means their long run realistically on a Saturday can be around the 20 mile mark. If they're, if they're consistent in running 10 milers, their long run can perhaps double it. If, if they're fairly new to it and they're running four or five miles regularly, then there's no way I'm going to give them a 20 mile run. So, you know, without that plan in front of me, it's a difficult question to answer, but it just has to be common sense of it, it's, it can be double if the person is really consistent, but um, a double double is probably a good gauge in a way, especially if someone's doing five miles and the long run is, is 10 miles, but I don't work from as simple as that. You'll get a, from the consistency and the weekly accumulation and perhaps three tougher weeks and then one easier, you'll start to see the flow in somebody's training and then be able to know when you can quite, you can put them up and you're obviously getting their feedback um, because we, we, we're not, we're not robots. So you're hearing how they're doing with that and you're seeing how well they're recovering and perhaps how quickly they're running these runs as well. They're not trying to run them fast, but if they're having to walk a lot on those kind of longer runs, we're probably scratching our head a bit again. If that wasn't the designated session to put hiking in, uh, why has that person got to walk a lot? It's too far for them. So, you know, we'll, we'll just uh, bring that down again. But my next question, my next question I'm kind of asking myself is, uh, should I hike as an ultra runner? You know, should hiking be included? In, in your training schedule. And for me, it's an absolute yes, like absolutely. Um, most ultra runners in an event will end up walking uh, for sustained periods as well. You know, the old death march, some people might have to do for a long way. I know I've been there many occasions. And um, if you only train as a pure runner, you'll find it very difficult to keep a pace and, and walk well. So I'd say, yes, just to train the walking would be a great thing. Um, also, it's great recovery. I mentioned the IL-6 and why would recovery run. Well, just going for a walk is going to greatly en enhance and compound and compact your training. So also mentally. Now, if you, if you think walking's failing, and a lot of runners do because we've come up from 5K to 10K to half marathon to marathon, when, then, the, then the 50K, and we want to run. We're runners. That's what we do. So when if you get to the point you're walking, you're failing, and there's a real negative stigma with that in your own mind, your own inner chatty, your own inner voice, you've got to, you've got to change that immediately. Walking in ultra running, is not failing because you're still moving towards the finish. Some of the longer runs that I've done didn't end up as runs um, and you just got to keep moving. And the only way you go into finish is if you just, just keep walking it out and then run when you can. If you're going to beat yourself up that you're failing because you're walking, you're going to cause yourself to quit because you're just going to get on your nerves so much. Um, if you had a friend stood next to you having a go at you all the time you walked you wouldn't be friends with them for very long yet we do that with our own um, inner chatter so I would say challenge yourself to change the way you view walking and hiking if you hate it and you don't want to do it 
I would say don't do 100 miles unless you're a superstar that can just blast it out. And there are people that can, but the majority can't. And if, you, if you're going to hate that death march, if you refuse to walk, it's not the sport for you. Maybe come down and stick to the 30 miles, maybe the 50 miles. And I've had runners do that, by the way, where they've gone for the 100 mile and they've said, not for me that. Like when I walk, I hate it and, and I cannot, I can't mentally cope with it. It's not, it's not what I enjoy about running. So fair enough. They either go back to marathons or, or lower end ultras. So you'll find your feet with that. But for me, walking, I, all the great thinkers walk. There's such a beautiful thing about hiking and walking. I would never sacrifice my hiking just for running. I get so many emotional, spiritual positive benefits from hiking i would never take that out of my world and my life so on that level as well i'd be saying go into the hills and hike sometimes listen to the birds see the seasons change and take your time take a flask and just enjoy it because it's running we're training all the time we're working ourselves hard for me that the hikes are a real joy and i i, I will try and include about 20 percent of my miles as walking so if i do a hundred mile a week I dare say at least 20 have been walking and hiking and I, I want that balance and to value them, you've got to include them in your accumulative mileage. You're not going to walk much if you, if you take out uh, the mileage because you're going you're gonna to be obsessed with trying to get your running miles in. So include them in your weekly total. It's locomotion and that's what you need uh, as a runner. Okay, kit. Right, I'm going real basic here and I'm, I'm conscious of the time as well and that I, I talk way too much. So kit, back to basics. Um, people spend way too much time on kit. I'm going to hurt somebody here. I'm going to upset some people. But people spend way too long thinking, uh, browsing, talking about kit. Now, your kit is absolutely essential. I'm not saying it is. I'm not going to get caught in this binary nature again. But I think... 10% of your results need to go on kit, not 50, not 60, but 10%. Like, I don't understand how it could be so hard and so difficult to get your kit right in 10% of your resources. I think you can do that. Now, people might contest that and say, well, your trainers are vital because if you get bad blisters on a 200 miler, that could be your race over. And I'd totally agree with that. So I'd say, yeah, get your trainers right, but do it within your 10% of your effort. Like all, all I see around me and too often is people, you know, I, I, Harrier is, is a kit company. So I'm on thin ice and Kate's probably going to cut me off in a minute. But the thing is, is, um, you know, if you're talking about kit all the time and what watch to buy and, you know, what running pants to buy, that's a lot of investment, a lot of time. Do your research, speak to people, but keep it contained would be my strong advice. And the only way I can say it is like this. If you put 100 people on the start line for running 100 miles, OK, um, and you fitted them out all in the best kit that suited them. How much do you think that would influence the results of those people finishing? Because for me, it wouldn't influence it very much. That person is going to finish that race, whatever kit there is in, really. Um, and you can make it easier upon yourself. If you've got your kit right, uh, that's all you need All you need to do. The thing is, kit is so great now. You could, bind, you could blindly buy stuff, really, and get great quality kit. It didn't always used to be the case. But... Um, and it's why I've said when, when, when I've, I've used the Harrier bag, and this is just not, not just a plug, this is my genuine, honest feeling about it. And it's why I agreed to do this, because Kate always apologetically reaches out to me. Like she knows I'm not a commercial man. She, she knows I've got a pet hate against Kit and all this stuff, and I don't get any joy in buying trainers and all this sort of stuff. So she's always like apologetically approaching me. Do you mind doing this for, for Harriet? And the, the big thing is, is the reason that I say yes to Kate is because I love her ethos of simplicity and, and the way that she's tried to make her goods and products and the affordability of them so giving you the quality without paying through the nose now that that's close to my heart to, to do that because i don't think runners should have to pay through the roof just to run um, and so 
you know, your kit, you don't have to pay vast amounts for. Um, if you do a lot of races, you're going to spend more on your entry fees anyway. But just just get your kit right. Don't don't obsess about it. Um, if you enjoy kit as your thing, fair enough. You know, it's, I'm not I'm not one to judge on that. But I just think it distracts people. Um, and what, what's going to make the difference to you is training. Your consistency of running and being a better runner is where your focus should be going. Um, and if you spend too much time wondering, thinking, worrying about kit, uh, you're going you're to waste a lot of time. It's not going to be the deciding factor for, for most people, unless you get it terribly wrong, but that's different. Uh, nutrition. Again, I'm going to keep this in crazy simple. Um, nutrition during an event I'm talking about during a race. Your gut can only handle a real small amount of food. And I'm sure I haven't done my homework on that, on that exact amount as a figure. Google it and I'm sure you'll find it. But it, I know it's small and I know from experience it's a small amount of food. So the key has got to be little and often. When you're working your muscles running, they need a lot of blood and a blood, blood supply. It diverts it away from the digestive system and the gut to feed the muscles. Now, if you eat too much food, all that happens is you end up with food just sat in your gut. Um, you can't even extract the goodness from it in high volumes anyway, because your body can only take so much from it at any given time anyway. And so what happens if you don't eat little and often, you'll get hungry. Because um, over time, uh, you've not eaten for hours, let's say, your blood levels are going to drop, your glu glycogen levels are going to drop, and you're going to feel very hungry, quite disorientated and quite weak. So it makes sense you're going to want to take a lot of food on by the time you do. It's the biggest mistake you can make, of course, because I've just said that'll sit in your gut and you won't be able to digest it. And then you'll feel sick as that sloshes around your gut. So little and often is far more important than what you eat. Um, you know, I, I, most people that I coach and I've spoken to and my friends in ultra running, you know, they can eat anything really. Um, a balance, a little bit of all types of food from savory to sweet. And um, as long as they eat little and often, they've found that's what works for them more so than, than big gulps of food. You know, I've been on ultras. I see people stop at chip shops and things like this. Uh, I, I, I can't believe it. Um, I, I, I don't do things like that. Again, each to their own and they might be going slow enough after walking to burn it off. But I'm not I'm not I'm not a pub runner, uh, ultra runner or chip shop man. I, I just think it's way too much food. Gels really work. Now, gels really work because they have been specifically technically designed to give you all that you can absorb. So they give you no more, no less. They give you exactly what your body can take on board. But of course, so many people struggle with gut problems from gels. So what I would suggest is you gotta try and make your own gels. You gotta try and get on that way of thinking of what's in a gel, what can I eat that's like a gel? So um, I, I just take water and take salt tablets. And the reason I take salt tablets is because if I put 20 salt tablets in a bag, I can keep count of how many I've had. If I'm using things like mountain fuel and things like this um, or salts in my in my drink, then I'm not sure how much I'm consuming. And I might also end up in a position where I've got to consume it because I haven't got any water alongside that. So I'm, I'm, I, I like pure water, little and often food and taking salt tablets. And I know there's a lot of people uh, that do that. There are others. Um, that do eat a lot and they're all right with it, but it, it's quite it's quite rare. Um, okay, mindset. Mindset, just going to briefly touch on this. Um, two major types of mindset that we have, and we don't always stay locked into it, but we have a growth mindset or we have a fixed mindset. Now, aspiring ultra runners, really, we need a growth mindset because the fixed mindset is, is afraid to fail, it would see failure as a really shameful thing. It doesn't want to come out of its comfort zone. It worries what people will say about it. And it kind of thinks, I've got what I've got. You know, I, I can't really improve myself. I've just, I'm just not a great runner. That's just the way I am. That's that fixed mindset. The growth mindset says, 
well, maybe if I do this and this and I go on that navigation course or I seek some coaching help or I buy some Harrier kit, then maybe I can start to change and I can start to start to train and change. Um, and they don't shy away from failure. They see failure as a stepping stone to get where they're going and they do care less about what others might judge them upon. So we need to just be aware of growth and fixed mindset for starters. Or well, obviously in ultras and the further you go, and it is the further you go, the more mindset is going to play a huge uh, factor and influence on and whether you finish or not. Staying positive when you're cold, wet, hungry and tired is, is very difficult. Um, so developing your mindset it is key. What I would say, if you're training your body correctly within your training plan, your mind is getting trained anyway. If you're working hard, if you're being consistent, you're building up that self-discipline, you should be training your mind. You cannot separate mind and body. It's one thing. You know, there's a saying saying that train your mind, your body will follow, you know, and I, I believe it. You've, you've got to get there in your mind too. visualizations of the finish. Things like this can, can hugely help. If you can't see yourself finishing, uh, you got an uphill struggle. You need to believe you don't. You're not always going to be right, and we will all fail, and we'll we'll all DNF. But you at least need to believe you've got a great chance of finishing. Um, otherwise, when things get get hard, and they always do get hard, you're much likely to, to quit a, a lot earlier. Um, the other thing I would say about mindset as well, and and the way that you can improve it is by journaling. Um, by writing down your thoughts when you catch them if you've got a negative inner voice and who hasn't you know if you're getting it yourself when you're running uh, you're not fast enough or you're too old or you're getting injured all the time whatever it is again that thing that if a friend was saying it you you just punch them square in the face maybe but when it's yourself um you somehow think it's acceptable well you need to catch it journal um write down what, what thoughts you're having, how are they holding you back, look into your core beliefs, look, in, look into your core values, how are these things preventing you from progressing as a runner? When you get into, up, into the ultra world and the further you go as well, I think this is a problem and it's something that you need to address. If you can get in the best physical shape of your life, but if your mind breaks at 70 miles, you're never going to finish. So you need to, you need to look at it journaling like after my stroke uh I, I wrote a lot you know some people talk to a friend I journaled a lot I had a lot going off I had a lot of change I had a lot of trauma a lot of unanswered questions and by journaling what I was thinking and what I was going through gave me a place to put it and to reflect upon it and it's been it's, that was that's the hardest thing I've ever I've had to go through in my life and I'm fortunate that I've come through the other side uh, you know, very, very lucky man. But um, journaling, journaling helped me to do that. When I'm feeling better and feeling good, I do journal less. So uh, you could say I'm a negative journaler, but it, it's I do more of what I need to do at the time. Uh, and I think runners by journaling, um, or if it, even if it's just in your training notes, could uh, hugely benefit you get over some of those hurdles. Um, I'll keep these two last points brief, uh, running high points. I'll just stick to the benefits of ultra running, yeah? Um, this, this is my chance to sell ultra running to everybody listening. Everyone who's uh, never done it is going to go out and do it, and everyone who does it is going to do it a lot more uh, for the rest of their lives. This is my one chance, so I'm going to really go for it here. Um, running brings about huge benefits and we all know that as runners already ultra running for me just amplifies that like ultra running is like the benefits of running on steroids it's just it just can you can get it wrong of course but if it, when you get it right the, the beauty and the benefits of ultra running are just out of this world self-development first and foremost like my word to get good at ultra running it, it, you have to develop yourself in all areas. It's not just in your training, in your diet, in your sleep, in your recovery. It's in your mindset. It's in your reflection. It's in your whole consciousness as a human being. Like ultra running, as can running, 
can completely impress upon you a, a hugely different characteristic or personality. It can change you. People sometimes say to me, um, you're not like you was back then when you was a kid. And I'm like, I'm a totally different person because I'm doing totally different things. So that self-development and that, that consciousness and that self-discipline, you know, the paradox of freedom is that the, the freest people have the most self-discipline and they have the freedom because of the discipline. So I see that in people as well when they, when they have the discipline to stay consistent and sometimes do sessions they're not feeling, how much freedom and joy and peace that gives them uh, in, their, in their life. Health, obviously, running continuously and getting the volume right, of course. I'll look at the negatives in a second, but your health's going to be through the roof. Uh, apparently, and this is the, the medical professions told me this, you know, my, my brain was starved of blood for something like nearly five hours, the entire right side of my brain. Uh, the drugs didn't work and they needed to mechanically remove the clot from the right side of my brain. Uh, I was totally paralyzed down the left side of my body. And, and was dying to, to put it short, to cut it short. But uh, they told me because I was fit, because I was tr because I trained, my brain found a way once they removed that clot to get back to what it should, should be doing. Now, I find that hard to believe, but that's what the medical professions told me. I just feel very lucky. But it does make sense to me how hard the recovery has been. I did sometimes think, my word, if I was overweight now, a smoker, a heavy drinker, very unhealthy. Um, I, I can imagine how hard I would be looking forward. I'd be thinking, wow, I've got the, the hardest battle of my life. And it, it for, but I was fit and it was the hardest thing. So health, we, we can't, you know, I don't want anyone to have to go through what I did, but my, you know, thank God I was healthy. Thank God I was training because it definitely has, has spurred me on to get back to where I am. Um, connection to nature, connection to nature. I, I mean, I have an almanac. Uh, I like to look at when the meteor showers are going to happen. I follow the lunar cycle. I watch the seasons change. I've learned my bird song so I can hear what birds are tweeting and when rather than just hearing bird song. Uh, just everything about getting out there, which I think running would limit me a little bit. But ultra running allows me to go further. When COVID lockdown's not on, it allows me to travel and explore more as well and see a lot more and understand a lot more about the world and about myself. Um, and, and I think it is this revealing thing that can happen from running a long time. When In my early 30s, when I was uh, really picking up my ultra running, um, I kind of saw my life in a different way. And up until that point, I'd only really seen how people reacted to me. I'd missed the first bit of how I was with people. And so if people annoyed me, I thought it was them. If people did wrong by me, I thought it was them. And then I woke up to this huge self accountability and realizing, you know, that I was the knob. I was the, I was the dick and they were reacting to me. But strangely enough, it wasn't until I ran a long way that I realised how much of a dick I was. So it can be in a, in a good way because then I could act on it. So, yeah, that self-accountability worked well as well. Uh, the friends and the community that you will join, lifelong friends, um, you know, the challenges that you will go through. And ultra runners on the whole are very nice, modest, helpful people. You'll always get arseholes in any community, so there will be some. But overall, it's a very inspiring, encouraging, low-key, um, uh, modest environment where, where everyone's going to try and help you and, and, and be positive. Social media loses that side of it sometimes because people become keyboard warriors. But overall, in, 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 in the real world, nobody's like that still on the start line. Everybody's very nice. So those that haven't done it, people are very welcoming. People are always saying that events are so friendly and everyone's so inclusive and warm. So please don't ever feel anxious or nervous about the reception you're going to get as a beginner ultra runner, because it, it is phenomenal. It's, it's a great community. So they're, they're just some of the benefits. And I could talk for another hour about the benefits of ultra running, but you'll be pleased to hear that I won't. Last thing, 
uh, the negatives then. What are the negatives of ultra running? Well, it can smash your body to pieces. There's no doubt about it. It's like boxing. I went when I was younger, I was an amateur boxer um, and you can't play boxing. You know, when you're training and a lot of people train in boxing, it's great fitness, of course, it's great for your health. Um, and so, but when you actually get in the ring to fight, it's terrible for your health because somebody's trying to knock you out. So the training is great. And that's a little bit like ultra running. Ultra running training is fantastic for you. But then when you actually do the event, I can't really say that that's good for you. You know, to run 100 miles in one hit, I can't really vouch for that's a good thing for you to do for your body. But the training is, is fantastic for you. So that's a slight negative. Um, it, can, it can smash you about a little bit. Um, health issues. Now, this is a big one. And as a coach, I see it a lot. And it's happened to me. Um, immune issues. Um, uh, that's quite common because you're running so much and not recovering. You can really lower your immune system. And, and similarly, uh, your endocrine system. So hormonal problems is becoming more frequent among ultra runners. I, I smashed myself into the ground about five years ago. Um, and it wasn't my running. It was actually my lifestyle around it. So I ran hard, but then I worked hard and then I had a big social life and I didn't sleep. And I got endocrine problems that I can't get rid of now. So that'd be my big red flag. So yes, it's not the ultra running, but it's the mindset that a lot of people have who ultra run. They don't just be driven and motivated in their running. It's, it's the whole, their whole life is quite charging at things and moving towards things and if you're not careful and don't take the rest which i now do take you can get hormonal endocrine issues as well and the the final thing is let's be careful of arrival fallacy now we get this in all areas of our life but we get this arrival fallacy where we think if I could just run 100 miles, my world would be made. I would be such a hero. I, oh, my friends would be envious. I'd be a legend. Uh, I'd feel so good about myself. And I would have timeless happiness if I could just achieve running 100 miles. That's my life changed forever. The truth of the reality uh, it, it's nothing like that, you know. That, that's a great thing for you to do. And you can use your running for self-development. As I've said, that's a great positive, but just be cautious of this arrival fallacy because it won't give you happiness forever. It'll give you happiness for a day or two uh, and then you'll have to go again. We have to be conscious of the journey and the process. That's how we will grow happiness within us right here, right now, not being running to a means to an end all the time, but the running just being the end, being joyful uh, and, and enjoying your running. And it's why I've written the seminar, The Positive Runner, which is now available to book on SI entries, because I believe instead of just trying to get people to be better and faster and run further, I want to help people enjoy their running more. And to do that, we've got to look at our inner beliefs and our core values and why we might have that negative inner voice. I can think of nothing better for me as a coach to do than enhance somebody's enjoyment first and foremost. If we get the results as well, that's what we want. But what, I've, what I'm saying is the results and the achievements and the accomplishments and the attainments do not bring the happiness. The happiness is in within the journey of the running and it's the arrival fallacy. If I can just get that new car, if I can just get that pay rise, if I could just sell more of this, if I could just be more popular, you know, all these things never, ever come true. And I see a lot of ultra runners come into the sport or not a lot, but there are some that come into it expecting something that is not there at the end. Um, I said final thing, but I said, <laughs> I come back to, so why would you run ultras? You know, why would you run ultras? I, I hope that I've answered that uh, just from the benefits. It's not going to suit everybody, um, but hopefully nobody's been put off by that. And Kate asked me to give you some homework. Uh, my homework is going to be uh, journaling. If you don't already do it, then to, to challenge yourself to try and catch your negative running mind 
um, and and see and see what comes up and see if you can work with that a little bit. So if you if you're getting at yourself a little bit, obviously we're in a sticky situation with COVID. If you're finding yourself and your narrative getting negative because the world out there currently, predominantly, and always has a very negative narrative. Journaling can help you to take onus and ownership of your own narrative again and turn it around. So maybe even if it's just for a week, have a go at journaling if, if, if you haven't done it. That's it, Kate. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Fountain of knowledge. <laughs> Well, yeah, sorry. I, I don't know what time it is, but um, I know no, I went too long. Great. No, it's brilliant. Thank you. We've had a few questions, but we can probably um, collect them together to just get a few answers for people, if that's OK. Um, and yeah. what came up um, from a few people is about cross training and strength training. So, I mean, you can I know you mentioned swimming before that you used to do, but people have mentioned um, and MTB, yoga, what sort of strength and things, I mean, generic things, what do you do and what have you seen can work for others? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, what we've got to look at is I feel the more athletic we are as runners, uh, then the better we can run. But there's no doubt, like I said, it's unequivocal that running gets you better at running. So we have to offset this. Um I'm not a reductionist by any means by saying, listen, don't, don't do any strength and conditioning because it's just the running that'll get you better. I see some take that approach. I don't agree with it. But also, I don't agree with some of the articles that I read that you can do like kettlebell training or, you know, squats and deadlift CrossFit type stuff and become a great runner. You won't. You'll be an average runner at best. Like you might, you might do a couple of marathons, but you won't hit your best by running small miles and doing a lot of cross training. You'll just be athletic and able to do it. Um, you know, when, when I used to work in a gym as a personal trainer for 10 years, those gym lads could run a sub 40 10 K from athleticism, not being runners. So it shows you for the shorter distance, it can really work. I would be, I do something called somatics and I found somatics from having a stroke and it was the only thing I could do at first but I still do it now somatics is a, a very gentle movement therapy that reconnects the brain with our muscles I would be urging everybody to look up somatics um, and, and read about somatics because for me I think it's absolutely perfect for runners but of course lunges things like this have a place the thing is uh, in the running stride it is so unique um, in the way that our body loads and unloads the force. The, the, the jury is still out how much transfer you get from doing general strength work uh, to helping your stride. When I've done my Train Like a Champion workshops, I was always focused on uh, making that transfer. Can we, can we bridge that gap to not being just stronger in the lunge, but will it come through? to your uh, running stride. The, the biggest thing I can say about it is try and run a couple of miles after any gym session. So no matter what you're doing, um, you, when, when you activate muscles because you've just been working them, like you go for a little run because the brain will have access to more body parts than it perhaps did previously. And then when you run, it can use and integrate those muscles more. Um, and so that it's more about activation as a runner than it is um, strength. People say all the time, I, I've got inactive glutes, my glutes are dormant, uh, they're not strong. The point is you don't need strong glutes to run. You need active functioning, working glutes to run. Uh, and so you could just target your glutes, for instance. Generic strength training for running, I would perhaps agree with the reductionist, that is not the best thing to do simple little corrective exercises for your body and then running has always been my approach with it and, and that's kind of what I still do now but I mostly um I mostly do somatics now mountain biking yes but it's enduring swimming yes I know I said I did it but um I'm not saying I was right by doing it it is enduring still um so I would I would say that's not gr great cross training you almost want to oppose the running entirely and do something different. 
Great. So one of the ones that I thought was interesting came in from Simon and he was talking about he's quite competitive. And so how do you have a bit of race strategy not to be going too quick at the start, burn out? And then, like you mentioned before, the death march towards the end. Yeah, no, it's a great question. It's, uh, you know, it's not something that I've always got right. And there'd be a lot of ultra runners that admit any, any runner does this. Uh, especially on ultra running, it can be so difficult to know how you're going to feel later. You know, it's hard enough on a marathon, but um, the only advice I can give is to look at your training, look at what you're running, look at what you're capable of, and then just really rein it in. And again, this self-discipline to perhaps say, well, if I'm doing a hundred miler and I, I want to do really well, I don't want to be at 50 miles before a certain time. But again, that will come with experience to know what you can run the first 50 in and what you can run the second 50 in. But the thing is, on, on the longer races, you've always got some time to speed up if you feel like you can. Um, I'm not normally one of them people that can speed up near the end, but you know, you, you know that, that's if you, if you need it, if you could, you've got the legs in it, you've got the time to do it. You will never, ever run your best race starting too fast and then going into that death march. So, yeah, if you need to do it, set time disciplines on, on, the, on the first few stages and just do not allow yourself to go faster than that. If you can be more cool about it, if you can go more off feel, then do that. But I, I think people feel good and speed up. So perhaps the, the time discipline is the way to go. Do you use hiking strategically, you know, rather than I see people walking in ultras when they can't run anymore, you know, rather than walking a bit at the start and things, what do you do in your long races? Yeah, so I'm not, I'm not an elite runner. I'm not, I'm not like one of the speed goats, the faster guys. Um, I'm more likely to be one of the guys slogging it out over the longer distances. So hiking is definitely something that I prepare for whether it be in, in high hill reps. And I know that sounds really soft for people that always run them. I do run hill reps too, but I'll do and I'll give my runners high hill reps. I think they're invaluable to prepare. No, in, in, in your actual race, Ronnie, sorry, like if you're doing a hundred miler, do you sort of, you know, do 20% in your first half hiking or do you say that uh, you don't run anymore? No. Yeah, no, I think um, I don't use any percentages and I don't use any time values, although I do know that that does work for people. Uh, I, I, I can't stick that kind of stuff here. I feel it too intrusive. So what I will do is I will just literally keep sprinkling hiking into my running as, as, as I want to and when the, when the train allows. And if it's a flat run, I'll just, just be putting it in as, as and when. More to feel... Um, Again, if you're not disciplined to do that, then maybe a time structure of run for 30 minutes, walk for 10, something like that can really help people. But for me, yeah, um, I mean, on a hundred mile, I, I try and run up the entire hundred miles if I can. But when you're going more like 200, 250, yeah, I do, I'll, I'll try and walk before I need to. Um, and then, yeah, I, like I said, I'm not a superstar. I, I'm normally walking the last 50 on, on like long last 250 mile. Um, you know, I was near death the last 50 miles, so I certainly wasn't running much. Is that when you ended up in a hedge, hallucinating? Yeah, I ended up in, in, in many hedges uh, <laughs> and uh, many, uh, like, heavy, severe hallucinations, yeah. But that, 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 that's the, the dark side of the longer distances. But, yeah, to, to leave hiking out of your training on that kind of distance, to me, would be a, a huge mistake. Okay, and so sort of sticking on that, especially for people who haven't done an ultra before, have you got any tips on the mental and psychological way of training yourself um, for doing the actual ultra? Yeah, without a doubt, like I said, if you're training your body properly within your sessions, your mind should be getting trained along with that, your self-discipline to keep your consistency um, to stick runs out when it's when it's the right thing to do, to change your eating habits for the positive and get the sleep and the recovery as you should. Your mind's going to get trained. But then things like visualization of the finish and if you being able to accomplish it is great. The journaling, journaling like I mentioned, to write down these, these negative thoughts you might have and work on them. Work upon yourself, like know your values, know what you think of yourself and um, become more positive with yourself because 
when you get tired and when it gets really hard and especially if there's no one around you you're the only one that can bring you out of it that is a skill and it needs to be flexed and it needs to be practiced so um you know journaling is one thing i would recommend but getting to know yourself better will happen in your training anyway you, you've got to believe it as well you, you've got to have a, a real desire to want to finish if you're just having a go to see how you do and it's a really arduous task you're probably not going to make it so it requires this commitment as well okay great uh, we had a few questions on nutrition but i'm just going to let people know that we've actually got a session specifically on nutrition and fueling in a couple of weeks and um, with rupert bonnington from mountain fuel so we're going to just park those for today if that's okay um but one that came through is um when would somebody use a coach and how you know who do you coach and how do people choose a coach that's going to be good for them yeah, it's a great question. Uh, to me, coaching and any coach can really sharpen uh, the learning curve to, you know, stop some of the unnecessary mistakes. The, the person is always going to have to learn for themselves by a little bit of trial and error. But what a good coach can do is really steepen that curve and, and, and stop you making unnecessary errors. Um, someone like everyone really I had it I, I still look in on the coaching world uh, I second guess myself I look at my own training everyone really I think should be improving themselves and a, a coach can help you do that um, you just got to feel comfortable with your coach I guess and there's different types of coaching I'm, I'm online um, I'm, I'm not really on the phone and things like that. So if somebody wanted a lot of contact, I'm not the type of coach for that person. Obviously, again, if, if they wanted physical help, um, I'm not the coach for that. So it depends what that person's looking for. If they're looking for a plan and support and, and someone to bounce ideas off, set goals, improve mindset, all these kind of things, then that, that's where I come in uh, and I help people. But everyone's going to be different from exactly what they want. And obviously that'll be reflected in fees as well. If you want a coach that you can talk to at midnight at any given time or what have you, you're going to pay for it. Um, so it's uh, I try and keep my fees down and, and be concise with what I offer uh, to, to help I improve people's goals and, and, and ambitions. And then obviously getting those results and enjoyment, of course, enjoyment. Yeah, I've always found there's been plenty of communication with you. I've never felt that it's just been, you know, planning, no chatting. I think there's been quite a lot around it, even though it's been remote. Yeah, no, that's the thing. It, it, it's it's just the nature of it being remote. I, I'm, I'm available, you know, 24-7 and, and, and give a lot to my runners and, and, you know, certainly do not ignore them and support them the best I can. It's just to some people, if they want to talk, then they need a coach who's going to talk. You see, it's just it's just the nature of how you do it. Um, and my, mine is remote like that. But um, yeah, the, the periodized planning, uh, bespoke to the person, I think can really sharpen that learning curve. And also what I get told from my runners is um, the confidence that it can give you to know that you're well prepared. Yeah. Um, you know, because it's not just about my running it's far from that it's what I see over and over again with runners and, and from my research from my studies to know that this person is training right and I can tell them that and that lift can sometimes be the difference between finishing or not because they believe it if they go it solo and they pick ideas from here and there then they're always there's always that doubt whether they've prepared right and you know I'm honest with people and if I if I think they've, they've done what they need to do I'll be telling them that and if they haven't we'll still go off our strengths of, of, of what we've got but I'm certainly do not lead people up the garden path with with aspirations if I don't think they suit it if I don't think they're putting in the work for it then then we have that conversation yeah Okay. Uh, right. Last couple of nice ones then just to finish off. So somebody asked what's been your favourite um, and also your most difficult races that you've done or even runs that you've done? Yeah, I mean, the, the most difficult thing I've done or what I found most difficult was the race across um, Wales, Long Last from uh, Holyhead to Cardiff Bay, 250 miles because uh, I'd been ill as well with the glandular fever and that was my comeback race so it was further than I'd gone and um, I, I found it so difficult and uh, 
just the the last the last 50 miles in particular I didn't really see that coming I started getting lost and not really understanding what I was doing and and the whole fatigue and I couldn't really sleep it was all on a cycle trail so my feet felt like they was broken from from the tarmac it was it was a, a pretty grim dark experience in many ways towards the end but it's also you know perhaps my biggest accomplishment um, in, in some of those areas where I, I saw no way to the finish line, couldn't sleep, but couldn't move. And if I can't sleep, how am I going to recover to move? Um, and these kind of things and the this talking to people that aren't there, uh, falling out with, with Joan, uh, who, who Joan, I've never seen Joan since, but of course Joan wasn't real. The... Um, <laughs> Yeah, but very, very difficult uh, mentally and physically. I was very relieved to get to Cardiff Bay. But, uh, you know, the hill as well in 2014, the hill the hill was uh, pretty tough because uh, 160 miles up and down the same hill in December in Sh- on Shining Tour in, you know, minus seven, very, very wet, 70 mile per hour wind gusts, t- tough event. Um, but again, uh, if you train right and you believe you can do it, uh, then you, t- you tend to come through. And your favourite? My favourite has to be, without a doubt, uh, the Coast to Coast Run, the first big ultra I did of the 192-mile uh, Sir Alfred Wainwright's route because it was it was a huge leap to me from 100 mile um, and there was no, no no way of knowing that I could do it. It wasn't the race, the Northern Traverse, that now exists. Not many people... Uh, in my calibre anyway, had done it. A few elites had done it, but it wasn't a common route to do. I didn't have much insight or things to pull from to know. I just had to train hard and have that belief in myself that I could make it. And um, and doing it in the 55 hours for me. And that's when I used their coach personally and I used James Elson. That's a, that's, that's, I felt that, that experience personally is he's telling me, listen, from what you're doing, Ronnie, you can do this. So I believed him and he was right. Uh, without without that, I would have been totally in the dark and I, I, but I trusted him and it, and it worked. And um, so that, hope, that opens your horizons when you do something that you had no idea if you could do. And then, and then it's kind of gone forever then because you kind of expect yourself to be able to do the big distance again. And I've been lucky enough to do it, but... It's like the same thing, someone doing the first 100 mile, very special, going beyond it, very special. And then you just have to challenge yourself in different ways. But that first one, uh, yeah, that, that especially the further you go, it's just, uh, yeah, it's mind blowing. It's, yeah, it's, it's an amazing feeling. And um, what's next for you? Like, have you got anything in the pipeline that you'd like to do? Yeah, well, it's, it's not looking great for it, but I'm, uh, I'm on the Warriors Way in April 15th, um, which is the entire uh, Viking Way and the Herowoods Way to finish in, in Norfolk. So it's 260 mile, same format of Lonlass, uh, but all on trail should suit me more. The big problem I had at Lonlass is it wasn't always safe to just sleep by the side of the road. Um, but on, on Warriors Way, I'd like to think that it is. So... I can carry a bivy and I can carry like a summer sleeping bag uh, for the latter, maybe 150. And if I can't sleep in the checkpoints, which would be ideal, but I tend to struggle with that, I might just have to carry a bit more kit. But when I when I need to sleep, I should just be able to get my bivy out, get in a hedge bottom and sleep for 20 minutes. Um, and that should be my saving grace, I hope, because I really um, I've got brain damage as it is. And I, and I really don't want those sleep demons and those hallucinations because, I mean, they, they, they was to such a degree across Wales. Like, yeah, I'm, I'm not so sure you fully, <laughs> you fully get rid of them, you know? <laughs> I can't believe you're doing that. And when is that? that is that's it- uh, <laughs> April 15th. So, yeah, it's, it's hard to say whether COVID will allow that. Um, so I'm starting to hedge my bets, but I'm just training in the zone it will be on, you know, I mean, I'm just grateful that I can run yeah. uh, given what I've been through and, um, you know, take each day as it comes. But if, if, um, if I can't do that as a race, then, that, then I'm sure at some point when we're allowed, I'll have a go with a little crew or something, but I'll do something. Uh, my passion is in the big stuff. My passion is in uh, 200 mile plus. That, that's what I love because that's what challenges me so much. Plus I'm not an elite runner. 
So I'm, I'm not going to, it's not all about winning, of course, but it, it's quite demoralising to know that I could train really well and still finish like 20th on an, an elite 100 miler. Um, so that bothers me a little bit as well. I kind of think, well, where's my strength? And that tends to be what you enjoy more. And, and then I, I love the mind. I love the mindset. And I, I really get challenged in that domain the further I go. Um, you know, whereas a hundred miler, once, once you've done a lot of hundred milers, really, you should be thinking, yes, I can do this. But when you stand on the line of like Warrior's Way, 260 mile, I'll always be thinking, I'm not sure if I can do this. So I, I like that element of it. And could you tell people a little bit more about um, how they'd talk to you about coaching and also about your other workshops that you've got coming up? Yeah, sure. So I've got my website, uh, ronnystaten.coach. So uh, send an inquiry through the website and then we can take it through from that. Um, and also I've started up the Positive Runner, uh, which is available to book on SI entries. The first course booked up in February the one in March, the 8th, is, is half full now. So I'll probably be making more, but really excited. I've just qualified as a cognitive behavioural therapist, so I'm really excited to venture into the mind more, uh, in particular with runners. Uh, I think it's lacking. It's lacking in society anyway, but it's something we don't pick up on and we don't touch on. And the positive runner is all about getting runners to enjoy uh, they're running more really which of course will lead to better results and picking better goals and, and better ambitions in line with their values and beliefs so they um yeah i'm excited to do that and so if anyone wants any mental help with their running i'm I, hopefully i'm going to be progressively doing more and more in that and obviously my website for any coaching currently okay that's awesome thank you so much for your time this evening it's been no a great problem. session um, and uh, we'll let us know. We'll see if it's going to happen in April. Have they got a tracker? We can dot watch. <laughs> see if you I'll, have a, I'll have a tracker. You see, you can scream <laughs> when I start going the wrong way and things, yeah. which is almost inevitable. And uh, yeah, everything I've just been spouting on when, when, I, yeah. when I don't actually put it into action. But yeah, no, it should, it should do. But yeah, I'd just like to say thank you to you, Kate, for... Uh, the opportunity to speak to so many people about ultra running you know it's it's a, it's a massive passion of mine hopefully that comes through to people but well, I think it's great what what you're doing and you, I, I remember chatting with you on the trail when you had the idea of Harrier and I've, I've seen you develop yeah. it to what it is now and, and I, I've got uh, you know high hopes to where you're going to keep taking that so yeah well well done to you and to, and to getting the interest in it and and thank you for having me. Yeah, great. Okay, well, have a lovely evening then, and um, I'll catch up with you soon. Hope we get some hobo pace uh, yeah. later in the year, and then I'll see you at those. Smashing. Thank you very much. Good night. Okay. See you. Good night. <laughs>